All right, let's all stand. We're going to sing the heart of worship. <clears throat> seated. We're going to sing Sunlight. It's an oldie but a goodie. Wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me, and with the sunlight of his love my
This morning, for our prayer time, I want to remind you of something. Um, as our, um, as not only our country, but uh, places in the world uh, live in fear and look around them at the things that are happening, <clears throat> I want to remind us of uh, what happened to Peter in the storm. Uh, when the Lord was sustaining him and giving him the ability to miraculously walk on the water in the midst of the storm, it was when he took his eyes off, to, off of Jesus and he looked at the storm that he began to sink in the storm. Um, it's easy for us to look around us and say, woe is me. It's easy uh, for us to look at all the upheaval, not just in the, uh, the uh, physical realm, uh, in the disease realm, but to look at all the upheaval uh, politically and socially um, and to say, woe is us. Uh, but we're in the midst of the storm, uh, but Jesus walks on top of it. Uh, it is not overwhelming him. And he calls us to himself to rise above it as well and to come to him and continue the path toward him no matter what's going on around us, but we cannot take our eyes off of him. So I'm going to pray for us today that we will not get caught up in everything that's going on, that we will not be overwhelmed uh, because just as Peter in the midst of it, when he began to sink, he cried out to the Lord and the Lord took him by the hand and pulled him to safety. He will do the same for us as our trust is in him. So let's pray. Lord, I look around and I see faces of people who live in the same world that I do and see the same things that are happening. And yet, Lord, I pray that you will help us as a church family, uh, as a Christian community worldwide, uh, to not be overwhelmed knowing that you are in control that you can speak the word and save us, that you can reach out your hand and protect us. You can pull us toward yourself. And I pray, Lord, that our hope will be in you. Lord, I think of the passage of Scripture that says some trust in horses, some in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Lord, 
those chariots and horses represent our own means of solving things. And yet, trusting in the Lord our God is the only real answer that we have. And so I pray today, Lord, that you will help us to keep focused on that, that our trust and our hope will be in you, not in, in the virus going away or not in social stability to return, but in the fact that you are returning uh, and that you are uh, bringing hope to our lives in the meantime. And I pray that you will help us to focus on that. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, footsteps of Jesus. Let's all stand on this last one. Scripture reading this morning was, is from uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We are continuing today to look at the end times. I want to remind you, just because I know that I have a little bit different audience every week. I think you're going to have to kill that light again today. I feel like I'm uh, supposed to be moving or something here. But, uh, or, or else somebody with uh, uh, epilepsy is going to go into a fit and the service will be over then too. So uh, we will <clears throat> now. 
I guess that's mood lighting, especially after James Thomas just read the passage that he read. It would be bad to be sitting in darkness after that, wouldn't it? I want to remind you uh, back a few weeks ago when I started this that we were focusing on end times because I'd had several people asking me, do you think what we're seeing now is the approach of the end of time? Are we nearing that? And is the upheaval in the world a... uh, a portent of things that are soon to come. And so I'm trying to answer that question. And I'm actually going to answer that question not next week, but week after next, on the 23rd. I'm going to answer, to the best of my ability, that question, or at least, at least give some guidelines. To but, but each week, what I'm trying to do each week is to lay out some, uh, some biblical truths uh, that help us to see where we are in the timeline as well as to be ready for it whenever it happens. Uh, And so this week and next week, I'm going to be specifically looking at the Olivet Discourse, which uh, is Jesus' own words, as I said. Uh, It's his own words about the end of time. Uh, We're looking, we looked the last two weeks in Luke 17, which while it's not the Olivet Discourse, part of it is included in the Olivet Discourse in both Matthew and Mark, and Luke puts part of it in a different place, which it stands to reason if Jesus thought it important that he would say it more than one time. But we're going to be looking at the Olivet Discourse this week and next week. Uh, and, and I will just tell you up front that when you get into this, what, what I've said so far, I don't think too many people could disagree with. Uh, and of course... Uh, We talked the first week about seeing that day approaching. And to just sum it up, you know, that that as Hebrews 10.25 says, that we should be meeting together more and more often as we see the day approaching, which gives us the hint. And in more than one place, you know, it talks about the fact that the, the, the second coming is going to be like a thief in the night, but it says you are not in the darkness that that day should overtake you like a thief. And so... You know, uh, believing that we can see it approach based on what Scripture says uh, is, is foundational. And I believe uh, that most Christians would believe that at least to a certain extent uh, that we can see signs of the times as they are called. And then last week we talked about the fact that most of the world is not going to see it. And we looked, we looked at the passage of, of Scripture where Jesus specifically says that, where It's going to be like in the days of Noah when they were just carrying on their normal life and boom, the floods got them. And then he describes it as like in the days of of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, when Lot and his family fled the city and boom, uh, they were all caught unawares even though in both cases they had been warned. But what we're going to begin to look at today is when Jesus begins to talk about it In the Olivet Discourse, he's actually answering a question. I'm going to be looking at Luke 21, but I'm also going to be looking at Matthew 24 because uh, the the reason that I've I've chosen Luke is because it says something very important that the others do not say, or at least it uses a phrase that that, uh, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 do not use. Uh, and, and I want to get it because it will help us to understand our goal is to know where we are now. That's kind of this whole series, you know, where are we now? And I want to explain that. And so I'm going to look at how Jesus answered that question. So I want you to take your little, if you got one of them little markers in your Bible or if somebody gave you one, laminated, or if you got a bulletin or something, stick it in Luke 21, okay? And then I want you to go back to Matthew 24, We're going to be predominantly looking at Luke 21, but I want you to go to Matthew 24 because it helps us to understand where where Jesus is coming from when he answers the question about when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. This gives us the scenario in which the, the Olivet Discourse takes place. It starts out in the temple courtyard, okay? Uh, they're walking through the temple courtyard and, and the disciples are with him. And here's what it says in Matthew 24. And Jesus came out from the temple 
and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. In other words, the beauty of everything and the, you know, the, the return, slow return to its glory after it was rebuilt and, and all, all of the things. And he answered them. This, this was when they were describing, you know, just bragging on and talking about the beauty of the, the, the temple there in the middle of Jerusalem. Here was Jesus' answer to that. He answered and said to them, Do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another which will not be torn down. That piqued the interest of those disciples. And I think as they left the city and walked out toward the Mount of Olives, which is why this is called the Olivet Discourse, because they were on Olivet, the Mount of Olives. As they were walking out there, I'm sure they were discussing, did you hear what he said? The temple is going to be destroyed. The center of our worship. What, what's he talking about? How, how are we... He must, be, he must be talking about the end of time. He must be talking about the world itself coming to an end here. They, they were puzzled. And so it says in verse 3, As he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the age. Now, in order to understand this, you've got to understand the way the disciples were seeing this. They assumed that the destruction of the temple could only mean one thing. That Jesus himself, as they understood his teaching, was going to, going to take the place of the temple. And when it was destroyed, that was going to be it. They're asking this as one question. Although it's actually three. It's actually three questions. They said, when will these things be? They were referring to the destruction of the temple. And then the second question they asked was, and what will be the sign of your coming? And then the third one was, and what will be the end of the age? They really, they assumed this was one question. But Jesus answered all three questions. The Olivet Discourse answers, when will the destruction of the temple take place? When, what will be the signs of your coming? And when is going to be the end of the age? And what will usher that in? That, that is what Jesus answers. And so we can find out from this all three of those things. Now, you understand that this would have been sometime around 30 AD, give or take. Maybe, maybe 28 or 29 AD, depending on the time. It would have been... 28 or 29 A.D., we know because we're standing on the far side of it that the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. And that leading up to the temple destruction, if you, if you go read Flavius Josephus and you read other uh, secular historians of that day, you find out that it was a terrible, terrible time. Millions of Jews were slaughtered. The city was burned to the ground. If you ever saw the movie Masada, you kind of got a sense of what happened as uh, people fled Judea into the mountains and all of those things. It was a terrible time. But it was still 40 plus years ahead. He's going to answer that question even though it was still 40 years in the future. What, when will these things be? But they assumed that the destruction of the temple had to mean... That Jesus was going to be coming and setting up his kingdom in the place of the temple. But such was not the case. And, and today is, is actually, I, I hate, I don't want to call this is not preaching, but more teaching. But all preaching should be teaching. And all teaching should involve proclamation and preaching as well. This may lean more toward teaching, but I want you to understand uh, that this is crucial for us to understand what, what we're ever living today. He, he, gave the, he gave the disciples an understanding of what was coming for them. And he explained to them, it's going to happen in this generation. So, 
with that understanding, and by the way, several of the disciples were still alive when the temple was destroyed. Now I want you to go to Luke 21, and I'm going to read uh, a good portion of Luke 21, because he doesn't really, the reason I went to Matthew is he doesn't really lay that question out in the same way in Luke 21. Beginning in verse 5, we kind of get a sense. It gives us that question again with a little bit of the uh, uh, side view of it from what I've already told you in Matthew 24. While some were talking about the temple, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, as for these things which you're looking at, the days will come in which there will not be one stone upon another which will not be torn down. And they questioned him saying, teacher, When therefore will these things be and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? So right now it begins to focus specifically on the the temple destruction. But you can see that by the full question in Matthew 24, they assumed the end of time would come with it. So now I'm going to read from verse 8 all the way through verse 24. So I want you to stick with me. This is important. This is one of those things that you need to listen. Read along in your Bible or listen. And he said, see to it that you be not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. But the end does not follow immediately. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, plagues and famines. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake, it will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. So make up your minds not to prepare beforehand to defend yourselves. For I will give you utterance and wisdom, which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be delivered up, even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, And they will put some of you to death. And you will be hated by all on account of my name. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is at hand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of the city depart. Let not those who are in the country enter the city, because these are the days of vengeance, in order that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles." Until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. I want you to understand that uh, the Left Behind series is an interesting read, but he misses some things pretty bad, okay? Um, And I'm not criticizing him, he gets some things right too. But what we must understand, remember that Jesus is answering three questions. When will the temple be destroyed? What will be the signs of your coming and and of the end of the age? Those are the three questions. What we see predominantly in the first part of this is the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I want want to point out a couple of things to you. When when he says a lot of these things, and a lot of people say, well, it... And if you read all three accounts, that you you see that there is some bleed over in the way that he answers, when will the destruction of the temple be? And when 
will the end of time come? There's, there's a bleed over, and there's a reason for that. Uh, you, you will see, and we're going to read in just a moment, that, that Jesus refers in the Olivet Discourse, in, in Matthew, he, he describes it accurately. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the most holy place. He, he refers to what Daniel in the, in the magnificent prophecy of the future. In Daniel chapter 9, he is, re, he is referring to that abomination of desolation which we have come to know as the Antichrist. But, but please understand this. The, the Antichrist has been personified more than once. In fact, I want, us to go, I want us to go for just a second to Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel chapter 9, by the way, is the key to understanding all end times prophecy. Uh, the, the book of Daniel, specifically uh, chapter 7 and then chapters 9 through 12 are the keys to understanding biblical prophecy concerning the end of time. And if you did not come when we were going through the book of Daniel on Wednesday nights, and then I'm going to say some things that may not make as much sense to you, but if, if you were here when we did the study, we went slowly through these things. But I want you to go uh, to Daniel chapter 9 because I, I need to point out something and it's going to help us to understand where we are in time right now. Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to begin reading toward the end of the chapter. Now, I'm not going to begin in verse 20, but in verse 20, uh, we get a summary. Daniel had been praying. Daniel had saw, and he had seen in, in uh, the book of Jeremiah that, 70, that they were going to be 70 years in captivity. So Daniel did the math. We've been... Almost 70 years in captivity. The time for the end of that must be coming. And so he began to pray and confess the sins of himself and his nation before the Lord. And to ask God to have mercy and let, let the 70 years when it comes, let them return to their homeland. And, it's, and it says in verse 20, as I was praying, an angel came to me. It was Gabriel. And Gabriel gave him a prophecy about the future. And I, I, th this is a place where I diverge from many, uh, many people who describe the end of time. I, I'm a little bit different here. I think I'm right or I wouldn't believe it. And I'll help you to be right by explaining it to you. Okay? But here, here's the thing. He said 70 weeks or 77s, literally, and it turns out to be years. He says 70 sevens, 70 periods of 70 years. In other words, 490 years have been decreed for your people. And without doing all the math, I will kind of explain it. I'm going to read this passage and then I'm going to explain it so that we can understand we're trying to, to tell the difference in when Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and talking about the end of time. We've got to do that if we're going to understand he says, 77s have been decreed for your people, the Jewish nation, and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So you, Daniel, you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, and this was about to come, the decree from Cyrus to allow the people to go back. The clock was going to begin counting then. From the decree to go forth and to build and restore Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be built again. Jerusalem will be built again with a plaza and moat, even in times of distress. And we can read that from the book of Hezekiah and the book of Ezra. We can read that, that part in that time. Then after 62 weeks, the, second, the 62 weeks after the seven or the 62 sevens, the Messiah will be cut off 
and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and to grain offering. And on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate even until a complete destruction. One that is decreed and is poured out on the one who makes desolate. That is where the abomination of desolation comes from. Now I want you to go back to Matthew chapter 24 once again. And then I'm going to try to explain this without trying to bore you or lead you down a rabbit trail. Okay? Verse 15 of Matthew 24 says this, Therefore when you see the abomination of desolation which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place let the reader understand by the way you're the reader okay you're one of the readers but also when this was written when Matthew wrote this he wrote this for those who were going to be in Jerusalem when the abomination of desolation stood in the most holy place and desecrated the temple of the Jews in 70 AD. He says, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are on the housetop not come down and take anything because then is going to be the days of distress and tribulation like you've never seen before. Now, Daniel prophesied of the abomination of desolation it was first of all fulfilled just about 400 years or about 200 years after Daniel uh, prophesied this in uh, one of the Seleucid kings known as Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes he came and he desecrated the temple he offered swine on the altar And you know a swine, a pig, to the Jewish people are unclean. And he desecrated the temple. He destroyed it. And I won't go through all the history of that. But that was the first time that it happened. It also happened in 70 AD when the the Roman general Titus came in and they desecrated the temple and offered incense to their gods and they destroyed it and they slaughtered the Jewish people. And the ones who bound themselves up inside the walls, they let them sit and starve to death. Millions of them died. This one specifically in 70 AD was the one that Jesus was talking about. And that's why some of these things, when he says them, they are both true of 70 AD and they are typical. Just like Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, was a type of Titus who was to come, who was a type of of the Antichrist who is yet to come in the future that the New Testament talks about, that John warns us about in 1 John that is to come and that his spirit is already at work in the world. And it's the one that Paul calls the man of sin. When he says that day will not come until this great falling away comes and the man of sin is revealed. But, but while you're in Matthew 24 there, both in Matthew and in Luke, Jesus flips back and forth between the two events. There will be times when he tells of terrible things happening, and he says, but it will happen before this generation passes away. But then there are times when he flips back and forth Now, I want to try to explain to you where we are in all of that without taking two weeks to do it. Luke says something that gives us a hint that Matthew also says 
Um, I want you to look. In Matthew 24, beginning in verse 4 and going all the way through verse 14, he's giving us a picture of the destruction of Jerusalem, about the false prophets arising, about many of them being put to death, and about the chance to go before. Now, it's, a, it's typical of what is to come for us in the future, but he's prophesying of answering that first question. And I want you to notice... As, as in verses 13 and 14, he says, But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations. And then the end shall come. You see, he couldn't be talking about the destruction of Jerusalem only. There's something else that happens between the destruction of Jerusalem and the return of Jesus. And Luke describes what happens between the the destruction of Jerusalem and the return of Jesus that separates it in his arguments and in his explanation of answering these questions. In Luke 21, it says this. And it's where we ended. In verse 24, it says, And they will fall by the edge of the sword... And will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now here's where I differ just a little bit. And please bear with me because I need to chase this rabbit so that you can understand where we are, what we're waiting on, and what's going to happen to usher in the final day. Back in Daniel chapter 9, when we were there just a moment ago, it was saying, you know, it'd be seven weeks and 62 weeks until Messiah the Prince cut, it comes, but he's gonna, and he's going to be cut off and we'll have nothing, and the people of the Prince who is to come, that's the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, that's Titus, As well, they're going to destroy Jerusalem. But then the next verse says this, and it says, And he will confirm the covenant with the many for one week, and in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abomination he will make it desolate even until until the the consummation thereof. If you, read, if you read the left behind, that's a picture of the Antichrist coming in this final seven-year period. By the way, we've only counted 69 of the 70 weeks period. You know, uh, Gabriel told Daniel there's 77s that are determined for your people. Well, we only see 69 until Jesus comes. And then it says, and he will confirm the covenant with the many for one week, that final week. But in the midst of the final week he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease most biblical interpreters not all some of them see it my way his way and some see it their way I don't believe that it's talking about the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 9 when it says he will confirm the covenant with the many for one week it hasn't talked about the Antichrist it says the people of the prince the prince the Antichrist only appears as a prepositional you know In prepositional phrase, the people of the prince are going to come and destroy. When it says, he will confirm the covenant with the many for one week, I believe it's referring to Jesus. Jesus came to his people to confirm the covenant with them. Do you know how long after he announced himself, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right after John the Baptist was put in prison and Jesus proclaimed himself? You know how long his ministry was? Three and a half years. He, he was coming to covenant, confirm the covenant with the many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. What happened to the temple? The crucifixion of Jesus. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. He was the final sacrifice. He was offered... As the final sacrifice, he ended the sacrifice and oblation effectively 
on that day when he died on the cross. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, and rejected him. But the temple sacrifices ended effectively for the people that day, because the final sacrifice had been offered. So that means there's only three and a half years left. So just hang on to that for next week. Not seven, but three and a half which also leaves some other things to point out next week. But here's the thing. The people, he came to his own and his own received him not. They rejected the only sacrifice that would ever be offered truly for their sins, of which all the other sacrifices, all the centuries before, were simply a symbol of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. Now I want you to go to Romans chapter 11 with me for just briefly. He talks about that rejection in Romans 9 and 10 and 11. And he explains something. He explains that the Jewish nation rejected him. I'm not going to take time to read all those three chapters or go through all of them, but I want to focus down on something. He explains, uh, beginning in verse 17, he's talking about, he's representing the Jewish nation as an olive tree. And that because of their rejection of him, the the native olive branches were broken off and wild olive branches were grafted into their place. That's his symbolic picture of the way. Because the Jews rejected him, they were cut off, and we, the Gentiles, in verse 16, or verse 17, he says, but if some of the branches were broken off, and you, Gentiles, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you're arrogant, remember that it's not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. And you will say, that well, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Therefore, behold the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, who rejected him, severity. But to you... God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, he's referring to the Jewish nation, they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree how much more shall these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree and then this is the culmination he says for I do not want you to be ignorant or I want you brethren to be uninformed of this mystery lest you be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in now, if you've got a reference Bible, most of you will find a reference in that statement back to Luke 21. And Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And here he says that the hardening of the heart of the Jewish nation has happened so that we would have the opportunity for the gospel. He came into his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God, even to those who believe on his name. So if you want to know where we are in the timeline, we're in the times of the Gentile. We're in the days of opportunity for us as people who were not his people, but have been given the opportunity to.
You know, there was something that happened every time that Paul went into a city to preach. You know where he went first? Where was the first place he went? The synagogue. You know what happened? He, he would get a few occasionally who would listen. But for the most part, they would reject him. And he would go to whom? He would go to the Gentiles. We are living in the times of the Gentiles. Now go back to Matthew 24 and we will land this plane, okay? Matthew refers to the same thing. I I wanted to specifically get to Luke 21 where it says, And Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Let's go back now to Matthew 24 where uh, it says in verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a witness to all the nations and then the end shall come on week one of this series when I went to 2 Peter chapter 3 when it was talking about the fact that the day of the Lord was going to come like a thief in the night in which the elements will melt and the earth will be burned up and everything will be destroyed. And then it says, in light of the fact that these things will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be in all holiness and goodness, looking for and hastening the coming of that day? This gospel will be preached in all the world to every nation for a witness and then the end shall come. We are now on the timeline in the times of the Gentiles. Jerusalem is still being trodden underfoot, is it not? They do not have control of it. The Jewish people do not have control of Jerusalem. They've annexed annexed part of the old city, but it is a fight every day to keep it. It is still controlled by the United Nations. This gospel will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end shall come. Hastening the how are we, what what do we do to see the Lord come back? We make sure that the gospel goes to every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation. That's our responsibility. Here, as I mentioned earlier, in about three weeks, we're going to have World Mission Offering Sunday. You want to know how to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord? See that everybody has a chance to hear the good news of the gospel. But let me throw a caveat in there, and I will be done. We're going through, on Sunday nights, we're going through the early chapters of the book of Revelation. We're specifically right now in the, looking at the seven churches in Asia Minor. Modern day Turkey. In the early church, these seven churches, and specifically Ephesus, but these seven churches were the center of Christianity. From which the witness went out everywhere. It's modern day Turkey. Do you know that as at one time it became the official in about 383 AD, I believe it was it was the official, the official uh, religion, I guess you could call it, the official religion of the whole nation in Turkey. By 19, well, just about 100 years ago, a little more than 100 years ago, it was down to about 25% Christians in Turkey. Today, it's one half of 1% in Turkey who are classified as Christian. And my point is not to say that the gospel is decreasing and not increasing because the church is exploding in some places around the world right now. But we cannot say that that. All nations on the earth have not had a witness in the past at some point. I can't say that. I don't know. Our job is to make sure that you see it's not only a geographical thing, but it's also a time thing. 
The gospel witness needs to go back into Turkey, which at one time was a center of Christianity, where all of the great church councils of the first 600 years in church history were held. And now it's one half of 1%. You see, in our time, it's not just geography, but it's time. Wherever the gospel is going. Only God knows when everybody, not that everybody had got, gets saved, but it says it will be preached in the whole world for a witness. And then the end will come. So we're somewhere in there. When, when the, the curtain is going to come down on the times of the Gentiles and they usher in that final three and a half years in, in Judaism's timeline, I don't know. If you go to the book of Revelation, that's all it's talking about is three and a half years. What you see in the book of Revelation is that final three and a half years that still awaits. 42 months, the 1290 days, the times, the time, time, the times and a half time. It's always three and a half years, and that's what that is what is ahead of us. I don't know when the times of the Gentiles, our opportunity for the gospel is going to go away. One thing's for sure. That is something that God only knows, but it also lets us know that our time could be very short. Do you know when, uh, a, a, been a few years ago, just a couple of years before uh, we moved back over here, Cindy, Cindy went to Uganda, and they went out billions of miles out in the bush where they lived in mud huts and, you know, drank water out of the mud holes, and, you know, they were just desolate. But you know something? They were sitting around outside those mud huts. The gospel is in their hands. It's available. And it may very well be, and this is something I'm going to say, we talk about week after next. It may very well be that with the advent of universal media, that is a sign that the time is closing. You've had the voice, you've had the choice. And then the end shall come. We're in the times of the Gentiles. Opportunities for salvation abound. But it will not last forever. Opportunities to be a witness and to share the word of God and the gospel of the kingdom. They're all around us. But that day could be very well closing. So I want us to pray. And as we pray, two things I want to, you to ask yourself. And we've been talking about being ready. I hope you've answered that question. And if you haven't, I'll be glad to talk to you anytime. If you're not sure you're ready as the curtain comes down and the final time plays out. Two, two things I want you to deal with. I want you to ask, am I doing all that I can do to see the kingdom of God come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Am I hastening the day? Am I ready? And am I hastening the day by doing everything that I can to get the gospel out to people who have never heard? And that's really where we are right now. Those questions, those determinations in our heart. If you are not personally ready, the Spirit will not always be available and convicting and drawing you to the Lord. There is a day when that ends. I'm going to ask Jenna to just play quietly. 
you need to come to the altar for any reason this morning while we're just quiet, sitting, with our heads bowed. You may just need to do business with God. You may need to come to him by faith. You may need to arrange your priorities. that you will help us not to slumber in the days of opportunity in the times of the Gentiles and I pray Lord that you will help us to always keep in the forefront of our minds that your coming is our hope and should not be our dread and I pray in Jesus name